application deployment. <laughs> so back in days, so we used uh, bare metal to deploy and install our application. So it took uh, days to week uh, provision our infrastructure. And it, it was somewhat OK uh, those days, considering the load and the demand we had. And we told those, those factors, uh, after those factors started to change, we wanted to provision our infrastructure fairly quickly. So we moved into virtual machines. Again, opposed to bare metal hardware, so we were able to provision our infrastructure within minutes. So whenever the demand comes, uh, we were able to provision the virtual machine and install our application and make it available within minutes, which was fairly OK. And the demand goes further high. And we, again, optimized this and installed lightweight operating systems and cut down libraries, uninstalled unwanted uh, software. And again, the, the, there's a limit that we can uh, achieve from those optimizations. So when we hit the ceiling, so we wanted for the furthermore optimization. Then, so we moved into containers. Why containers? I'm not stuck, so you can answer. So uh, it's fine. It's uh, boots up fast. It's light. It's lightweight. So easy to orchestrate and easy to manage. So those are some of the main reasons that we moved into containers. And we are, when we are talking about containers, so Docker is one of the leading technologies in this space. So there are some other players, but uh, Docker provides this uh, easy to use packaging model. So you can bundle your uh, application the configuration and dependencies, everything into an uh, image. And then uh, we call it a Docker image. And then you can run it anywhere in a Docker, wherever we can run the Docker. So wherever Docker is supported, anywhere in a Docker supported platform, you can run it. And also, uh, since uh, this has this universal package model, so we can uh, deploy these container images across all uh, platforms. So that gives us that operation uh, immutability. So ops people loves this. So especially when, when I think that you, wanted, you want to roll back a chain. So having immutability is a nice thing to have uh, when it comes to operation. Okay, we, we compared. Uh, Virtual machines and containers, and we, told, and we told that the containers are lightweight and it's fast booting. So when you start to compare this, you may think the containers are a trimmed down version of virtual machines. Are they? Okay. So let me quickly uh, compare this uh, side by side, side, then you, you will get an idea. For virtual machines, obviously we need uh, infrastructure uh, that can be uh, your local machine and maybe a uh, dedicated server. On top of that, we have, we, we have to install an operating system that uh, we, call, we label it as host operating system. On top of that, there's something called hypervisor. So a virtual machine is, uh, we can call it a self-contained server bundled into a single file. But we need something to run this file. So that's where this hypervisor comes into play. So we have the hypervisor. And then assume that you need to run four applications, four applications in total isolation. For that, we need four virtual machines. So four virtual machines means you need four oper operating systems. So we call guest operating system the one which is in the uh, virtual machine. So, this is one of the drawbacks in virtual machines. So uh, for a single OS, roughly you need about one GB of the disk space. And for, for applications, you need four guest operating systems, which means about uh, four GB of disk space. And also each and every guest OS needs its own memory and CPU and so on. <laughs> on top of that, you can have the binaries and libraries which is needed for the application and the application. As we discussed earlier, so we are, uh, these four applications are running in isolation. This is in virtual machine world. When it comes to uh, Docker, the container world, it's again needed this infrastructure as well as the host operating system. And on top of that, instead of hypervisor, uh, we have something called Docker daemon. So it interacts and talks with the 
Docker containers, and uh, so uh, basically Docker daemons is the one which runs the Docker uh, images. So on top of this Docker daemon, uh, rather than having this virtual machine, uh, machine, so guest operating system, we can have the binaries, libraries, and the application. So here, uh, this layer, instead of this operating system, we call this layer the Docker images. So we don't have the host operation, this image, and the Docker daemon will run that image. So yeah, even though uh, it doesn't have uh, operating system, the isolation is there, so the Docker daemon will take care of that. Then. And then. So anyway, so then, the, uh, go back to the previous slide, so the, the, it is the, uh, the Docker containers and virtual machines, they are not the same, so the cont a container is not a trimmed version of a virtual machine, they are two, two separate concepts. And anyway, in container world, the best practice is to run a single process in a single container. You can run multiple processes in a single container, but then you will lose some of the advantages you get from get uh, when you are running in a container. For example, uh, if you have multiple processes, you don't have the control over those processes. So if one process eats uh, so much of resources, it will affect the other process. But on the other hand, the best practice is to run a separate process per container. But in these days, the, all these uh, this aggregated architecture and microservice architecture, architecture, we need tens of hundreds of services per application. So we have a problem, so we, we need some sort of uh, management or orchestration to solve this problem. So that's where this Kubernetes comes into the picture. So it's, a, it's an open source. Uh, container orchestration system, a system so you can automate and do the deployment and do, do scaling, all sort of things from uh, Kubernetes. <laughs> and so let me quickly go through uh, the Kubernetes architecture. This is a very rough uh, detail about the Kubernetes architecture. So this Kubernetes architecture has a control plane, plane, so we call it the Kubernetes master. A user can interact with this Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes master from UI or from a CLI tool from through the API calls. And whenever a task is assigned, the Kubernetes master will schedule those tasks in backend servers. And user doesn't have to know the number of nodes in the cluster, the resources in the cluster, the kernel version, the operating system that runs in the node. So user doesn't have to know anything. So user will blindly schedule that task and it will get done in the uh, backend node. So then I'll go through some of the uh, basic uh, Kubernetes primitives. Then uh, you can uh, hopefully you can use, use that when you are deploying your application in Kubernetes. Pod. Pod is the smallest unit in Kubernetes. So that can contain a single container or multiple containers. As we, as we discussed earlier, so we, sometimes we need multiple containers to run ap applications. Uh, when you need multiple containers to run applications, uh, you hit, uh, run into problems that sometimes you need to share the file system. Maybe you need uh, to uh, 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 talk to each and every container. Maybe uh, you need interface communication. So uh, if you have separate containers, you won't be able to achieve that. So, but uh, in a port, it's in a single namespace, so if you have multiple containers in a single port, so you can achieve all those. Still, the, the container itself will uh, separately handle the CPU and memory, so the isolation is there, so it's kind of a balance between isolation. isolation. Did I see? It's something. Yeah. And the volume, obviously, so, you need uh, disk space when you when you are running the application, so you need to share the file system. So you can mount this Kubernetes, mount a Kubernetes volume to a pod. So it can be a local storage which is mounted in your host operating system, and even you can mount a cloud storage like AWS EBS or GC GC Drive, even cluster storage like NSF or cluster wise cases in there. So all those are possible, and basically. So Kubuntu has this uh, volume abstraction. So 
Uh, depending on your needs, so we can, you can decide so what's the mechanism that you are going to use for the volume. Replication control. So replication controller will ensure that the defined number of pods are in your environment. For example, if the defined number is four, if an, a pod goes away, the replication controller will uh, spin up another pod, and it will make sure the number of pods are four in the environment. And also, we can use it for the scaling, the manual, actually for manual scaling. So from a single command, you can uh, scale up or scale down the environment using this replication control. k service. So we can think k service as kind of a virtual load balancer. It will have its own IP. And also, the pod itself has its own IPs. So we can bundle uh, multiple ports in a, into a single service. So whenever we tra route traffic to the service, it will load balance those traffic through uh, the ports. And there are different types of ports. Uh, one is cluster IP. That's the default and most simplest one. So when you want to expose your service internally, you use cluster IP. And there's another one called node port. So if you want to expose the service externally, so the name itself says you can expose this service through a port. So whenever the request comes to that particular port, it will get uh, load balance through, uh, through the uh, uh, ports through the node, node uh, cluster IP. And assume that you want to expose your service outside, probably to the internet. So in that case, uh, uh, there's a service type called load balance. So if you're running your Kubuntu's cluster in a cloud infrastructure, cl cloud service, so if it supports, uh, from this load balance type, it will create a load balance in that cloud service. So it's like a node port, but uh, the, the, it will create a load balance as well. So the traffic, the, whenever traffic comes to that load balancer, it will reach the no, uh, uh, Kubuntu ports through the node port. And secrets. Again, when you're dealing with applications, uh, you, you need to deal with secrets, secrets such as um, it can be credentials, it can be certificates, it can be um, keys. So in, when, you are, when you are in bare metal or virtual machine, probably we can provision your infrastructure and copy the, these secrets to the virtual machine. But in container world, you have to bake everything into the image. So the one possibility is bake everything into the image. But is it good practice? Again, I'm not stuck. So oh, there are a few reasons that we are not, uh, not to do it. One is uh, if you uh, see, uh, assume that you need to change the credentials. Whenever you change the credentials, you have to rebuild the image. You, if, uh, whenever you want to change the certificate, you need to rebuild the image. So it, it will be an additional step. And also security reasons. So whoever got access to the, that uh, image will have all those secrets. So for that, the Kubuntu's have a uh, concept called secret. So we can attach those, see, see, uh, create a secret and attach that to a Kubuntu port. So it will mount as a virtual volume. That means so it will, it will remain in memory, so it will not write with this. So whenever the port goes away, uh, the secret will be destroyed. And namespace. This again. So when you have a uh, namespace is kind of a small cluster within your Kubernetes cluster. For example, if you have a one team and few services, it will be it's easier to manage. But when you have multiple teams and hundreds of services, having separate namespaces will be beneficial. So uh, for security reasons, and even it will be helpful for, uh, for uh, performance. It will improve your performance as well. The, when, you're creating, the, when you're creating resources, you can define the name, namespace. For example, so you can say, create this number of ports in this namespace, create this number of volumes in this namespace. Or likewise, you can uh, define uh, the namespace, and also be, you can even have policies to that uh, namespaces. And config maps, the same as uh, secrets. So you have application-specific configuration, and similar to config maps, yes. Uh, one option is to burn them into the image. So uh, sometimes so we need to expose these uh, con configurations as environment variables. 
Then, uh, main drawback is same as secret, so whenever you change the configuration, you have to rebuild the image. So uh, for that, we have the concept called config map. So again, the, after creating the config map, you can again attach that to the pod, and it'll uh, be a virtual volume again. And more importantly, uh, all, all the variables will be uh, exposed as environment variables in the container. So that's one of the advantages of having a config map. And services, we, uh, actually we didn't explain, so services are kind of a layer for load balance, so it will load balance through IP table rules. But uh, see, uh, assume that you need load balance from host address or URLs or something, like uh, lake layer server, server load balancer. For that, you, you can use ingress controllers. And one of the uh, main features that I like, so especially those people, the rolling updates. So for, with rolling updates, you can do updates of, a, of your application to a newer version without service disruption. So you don't have to handle it manually. The service rolling update will handle it itself. So when you do, uh, do a rolling update, what happens is it will create another replication control. And uh, gradually, so it will increase the number of replicas in the new replication controller and uh, get rid of the uh, replications in the old replication control, and gradually all the nodes will be, uh, all the ports will be moved to the new version. And daemon said, that's again, if you want to run a port in each and every node, uh, for uh, like monitoring daemons or log daemons, so you can use daemon sets for that. Graceful termination. That's again come, comes by default with k uh, is and the default value is 30. So for example, when you, when you are scaling down, so it will, uh, it will give a grace period. So it will, uh, the pod will give a uh, sig term and your application can listen and gracefully shut down your application. So after 30 seconds, this will do a forceful shutdown. And and one more thing, this horizontal pod rotor scale. So I think we discussed yeah, replication controllers. And uh, replication controllers will ensure that there are a given number of instances are available in your uh, environment at a given time. But assume that we ne you need the given number of instances whenever on only there's a need is there. So we can use the pod dot scale. So we can define the min and max values. And uh, currently, so uh, it can auto scale from the matrix CPU utilization. Okay, let's uh, move into a couple of uh, demos. Yeah. So uh, I'm running Kubernetes in my local machine with the Docker for Mac cache. So if you want to uh, run uh, Kubernetes, you need to have Kubernetes artifacts. That means uh, YAML files. So I have created a simple YAML file here. So I have, uh, uh, we have a service here. And, and I have specified my uh, Docker image here. And I'm creating a deployment as well. So once we run this service, it will create a uh, run this uh, uh, artifact. So it will create a service as well as a deployment. So let's run this. So uh, before that, uh, let me run through a few of the few of the commands that we use in Kubernetes. So to run, get the ports which are running right now, so we can run get ports. So it will list, list down the list down the ports which are running right now. So kubectl get cc. So it will list down the services which are running right now. So uh, I'm going to run my service. So the service is created, and also the deployment. So now when we try, the pod is created here. And you can get the service as well. So you can see. This. So I created this uh, service as an output, so you can see the outputs here. So I can do a curl. <laughs> so 
it just executes. So I'm going to delete this, uh, this, delete this service. So, so it's terminated. And yeah. So we can use uh, t uh, some tools to uh, uh, create Kubuntu artifacts. So as, as I described, so we need uh, to, uh, to run Kubuntu artifacts, so you need to create YAML files. So, or else you can use tools. So it will generate this YAML file. So some of the tools, uh, tools will provide uh, external commands to run uh, uh, applications in Kubuntu. And some, uh, you can define your deployment artifact within the application code. Uh, so, uh, uh, such as uh, Metaparticle and Ballerina. So the next demo I'm going to do is with Ballerina. Again. Uh, this is a simple program written in uh, Ballerina. So it has a service. And within my code, using annotations, I can say I, I want to create a, so here, a Docker image, see? So that will uh, create a Docker image out of my service. And also, so I'm going to create a Kubuntu service. Uh, the, type, uh, the type is Nodeport. So within the application code, you can define that. So uh, when I'm going to run this, so I can build this one. So. Now, so it will create all these artifacts. You can see. You can see. So the, the, that that uh, this generated all the Docker files and all the Docker artifacts. So now I can run this. So you can see the service. So again, we can do a curl. So it ran this. So ran this service. So which is uh, very easy. With that, yeah. So. That's all I have to share today, so any questions?